Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this latest uh, session in our series, um, Learning from Labour History. Today, we're looking at the rise of uh, new labour and was it a Blairite counter-revolution? Interesting question. Um, first, apologies. I did um, fiddle around with uh, the Zoom settings and that means basically all registrations were deleted and everybody had to re-sign up which means we're quite down uh, in numbers this week compared to the last few weeks but um, apologies we will put this video up online and we're also um, live streaming so I hope some more comrades will will join us once they notice that um, their registration ring doesn't work apologies about that it's new technologies and we're we're all learning okay thank you very much Kevin for joining us once again and um, I've spotlighted you now fire away Okay, thank you very much, Tina. Um, I, um, when I gave this, uh, this talk at the title of Counter Revolution, I suppose I was thinking of the, the idea that a very popular idea within the Labour Party and Labour movement, and I think on some of the Labour left, that Blairism represented something of a qualitative break in Labour history, and that uh, indeed, it marked a break, as Blair himself would often say, uh, between old Labour and new Labour. And um, in his rhetoric, um, he often made that distinction between old Labour, the past, and new Labour, uh, namely himself. Um, and so I was quite interested to try to look at that, but also to try to perhaps explain or try to understand how far it was a counter-revolution, how far it represented really quite a break with certain aspects of Labour Party history, but perhaps more importantly, how far it could be said to stand in continuity with, with other aspects. So coming effectively at the end of these sessions, it's, it's quite a useful point to, um, to maybe look back and see these patterns of, of similarity. But that's not to argue for anything ahistorical. It's not to argue for a type of eternal left or a type of eternal right that is in some sort of um, historical struggle and that the left of the 1920s is the same as the left of the 1980s. But I, I, I do think that if we try and contextualize Tony Blair, what we might see is that in some ways he does encapsulate really the logical uh, conclusion of um, many sections of the Labour right and that his emphasis on newness and on a break with tradition is probably um, you know has its electoral uses but if we look very closely I think we will see some similarities but also some clear differences sorry to sound like a, a Guardian editorial that goes on one hand and then on the other hand but I think that um, there were some new elements, and I suppose why that's important for those of us on the left is that if we are uh, talking about any type of socialist project, any type of socialist movement um, in Britain, then we've got to um, um, we've got to, I think, uh, uh, understand, um, you know, quite exactly why New Labour was qualitatively different from previous aspects of the of the Labour right. Um, the other, uh, the other thing that I'd like to uh, consider also is some of the left-wing analyses of Blair, and maybe to try to offer my own um, about where Blairism comes from and some of the elements that make it up. Um, so let's, uh, let's try and trace some of the background then of, uh, of, of Tony Blair and this possible counter-revolution. Uh, since it's only a few years ago, although I was rather shocked to remember, I should be able to do the, the counting, that it's, uh, it's, it's close on 30 years ago, it only seems just like the other day to me, that Tony Blair was elected as leader of the Labour Party. Um, he, became the, uh, he became the leader in 94 after the, uh, after the death of John Smith. And although it was fairly likely that um, he probably would have been prominent in any future Labour government, I think that his, um, the, the death of um, Smith was, uh, was something of a shock, uh, although I'm sure that from what I read in his, um, 
uh, his autobiography, A Journey, which is on the table beside me here, that he had in many ways been sort of looking towards a leading position in the Labour Party. But men, much of the, the origins of New Labour, I think, does lie uh, much further back than, uh, than merely the, the early 1990s. And in some senses, we can see Blair as something of a sort of, um, uh, I hate to use the Hegelian term because he's not really up there with Napoleon, but he is a world historical figure. I think he does encapsulate quite a lot of social trends, quite a lot of uh, political forces. And in a way, he does make a very interesting sort of individual because he represents, I think, something of the, the transformation of much of what we might think of as the soft left. When you look at the, uh, some of the people that are, are around Blair or some of the uh, people that he brings into his cabinets, um, you often see that they begin on the soft left uh, rather than uh, the traditional labor right. And also, if you look at their ideological lift, uh, different um, influences, many of those influences are not from, uh, I, I suppose, traditional laborism. Again, uh, think of a comparison between the, the labor government of 74 to 79 and the type of people who are dominant in that government and then go forward, um, you know, 20 years or so, and look at the nature of the Blairites. And that reflects a lot of ideological and a lot of political and indeed economic and social change as well. The immediate, um, the immediate I suppose, lead in to, uh, to Blairism is, could I think be traced back in many ways to Callaghan and to aspects of the Labour right, but its immediate precursor is of course the Kinnock period as Labour leader, which we, we touched on uh, last week. Uh, in particular, uh, Kinnock's movement away from the more left-wing aspects of the, the, of the programme of 1983, and um, a clear sense of accommodation with Thatcherism. So that, for example, on some quite key issues, the Thatcherite consensus in areas like privatisation and trade union law is um, is broadly accepted by Kinnock and in the in the elections um, he argues that uh, a, a radical change a sort of flipping back a turning black isn't going to occur but we also have two quite big defeats uh, both for the left and for the labor movement generally obviously the prime one is the uh, the, the minor strike of 84 to 5 and this will have, I think, incredible uh, reverberations. And again, I don't think I need to perhaps explain to those two, two comrades, but the, the sort of sense of dislocation, of defeat, and indeed the, uh, the, the sense that starts to emerge in the late 80s that many of the, um, many of the battles are lost. Um, the the, the, poll, the anti-poll tax campaign is, I think, a, a very strong, very important movement. And it does, I think, win considerable victories. But there is, a, I think, a dark cloud cast by the miners' strike. And then uh, in conjunction with a number of other um, movements that we're going to see um, in the uh, early 90s, um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to understand there are going to be some, uh, you know, some quite big ideological shifts as well. In terms of the Labour Party itself, there's also the, um, the purge of, of militant and indeed other left-wingers, which begins quite early on in the early 80s, but then reaches a peak uh, after 1985. And uh, again, this sort of sense that the, um, that the left is on the defensive. So this is very much the sort of climate uh, of the background of um, uh, of sort of Blair's uh, period. Blair is, is a Labour MP after 1983. He's put into a relatively safe seat in the north of England and as a, as a young lawyer starts to make a name for himself. He's, he speaks on employment law and he's sort of seen as one of the sort of up-and-coming uh, stars in this way. Um, the other uh, milieu that I think Blair operates in is also that element of the soft left, which is very much, I think, influenced by forms of Euro-communism. Many of the, many of the, the people are, 
clearly influenced by the sort of fashionable uh, leftism, uh, and I use that word fashionable quite deliberately, of Marxism today and the Euro-communist wing uh, of, the, of the Communist Party. And this, this type of climate is, does form some sort of, um, I suppose, intellectual raison d'etre for people like Blair, um, thinkers like Stuart Hall, but also um, uh, Anthony Giddens, are starting to provide a, a rationale for um, a very clear and explicit movement away from any uh, ideas of class, uh, even the rhetoric of class, and very much uh, an electoral move into the centre. Now, this is, uh, this is often, I suppose, focused on by many people in terms of um, stylistic issues, um, the focus on spin, on image. And if, we, if we're trying to analyse Blairism and Blairite politics, often, uh, people will turn on that. And indeed, um, if we look at some of the uh, leading lefts uh, of that era, their comments about the emergence of people like Blair, Peter Mandelson, do primarily focus on this, uh, on this idea of spin and of style, and particularly the emergence of the focus group, the idea that uh, politics is about um, you know, attempting to appeal to the, the lowest common denominator and trying to appeal to a broad uh, electorate, particularly after the defeats of the two elections in, in 83 and 87. But of course, this, this process will be accelerated after 82. Now, of course, this, this sort of focus on spin, on electoralism, is by no means new. And in many ways, again, to just emphasize this, this pattern of continuity, you can see the same sort of things in the, early, um, in, in the earlier period, in the 1950s. Indeed, if, we're, um, if any of you are really interested, you might like to look at some books that Tony Benn um, wrote on, on this, this issue. Benn, in many ways, was one of the earlier sort of modernizers. Indeed, he was almost a Blairite in his enthusiasm for these forms of politics. Uh, he only really moved to the left much later, I think really from the early 1970s. So these, these ideas of uh, a series of ele uh, electoral defeats and a series of um, you know, disastrous campaigns, the need to improve the message, the need to look at modern means of communication. Above all, the idea of something new the idea of moving away from what was perceived as, uh, as, as Labour's uh, traditions in this way. This, these types of arguments, though, weren't, I think, just electoral opportunism. They were, I think, different from many aspects of Labour's right in the past. And again, I think we can see these foreshadowed really by the, 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 the crisis that social democracy faced in the, um, in, in the late 1970s. And in particular, that speech that I drew attention to last week that James Callaghan had made in 1976, in September 1976, about the party is over, that the, the old consensus, the Keynesian consensus had, had ended, and that we were now in a new economic and social period. And I think it's that idea of new times, which again, comes in from those forms of neuro-communism and various forms of uh, you know sociology in the academy this this idea that there'd been some sort of transformation in capitalism some sort of transformation in british society and that indeed new types of politics were you know were, were important again for those uh, for those of you that were um uh, take took, took took part in the meeting about german social democracy you will probably hear echoes of uh, Bernstein from the 1890s, uh, evolutionary socialism and so on. So these, these things had obviously been around in the labor movement before, but in the late 1980s, they were, I think, given uh, a, a particular, um, you know, a particular, particular impetus. And uh, I think that um, a series of both objective and more subjective factors 
um, you know, be, be, were going to be influential in this way. Now, upon um, upon becoming leader in '94, Blair very rapidly um, transformed the party, and that transformation was in again in many senses both ideological but also uh, organizational and i think the best way to see these is to see a sort of a culmination of a whole series of patterns which had existed uh, easily into the 1980s so for example the downplaying of the role of party conference uh, the lessening of the accountability of MPs to constituencies, and indeed the um, the, uh, the the role of, of the NEC and of the party conference in policy formation, uh, all of these uh, had been sort of going on a pace from the late 1980s. But Blair was to really pick pick them up and run with them, and this again, I think, this organisational shift put much more attention on the leader. And again, a very sort of popular theme here was uh, the idea of presidential politics. The idea that, that Blair was really a sort of an American style politician and that he was really, um, you know, he really wished to be a, you know, a, a, a president like somebody from the West Wing uh, television program that he was um, he was trying to focus power in on himself within the party and that indeed the 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 whole new labor project was built around him um you know in, in some things that i wrote at that time i referred to a, almost a sort of form of blairismo a type of almost bonapartism uh, that's not quite accurate but the way that the focus was on blair as opposed to on the movement now again there's nothing new here in this and you could look back at Wilson in the 60s. You could look back at MacDonald in the 1920s and 30s. But what I think is important here is that the, um, the institutions and the structures of the party were quite deliberately sidelined. They'd always been managed. We, we know that the trade union block vote had always been called in to support the, the Labour right as, as required. So nothing new there. But I suppose it was it was even getting rid of the um, of the sort of nod towards party democracy and accountability, which I think is uh, is I think so obvious and so, so um, uh, apparent, and indeed so deliberate because Blair's strategy, his electoral strategy, was exactly designed to do that. He demonstrated his um, his newness. He demonstrated his um, break with old labor by in a sense dismissing it but also also making it an enemy so any battles that he might face with the trade unions or any battles he might face with his left far from being an embarrassment were in fact a way of demonstrating his strength demonstrating his um, you know his sort of newness his difference with the past so we had then this this idea of a of a of a, a new lead leader um you know in the phrase that the the government employed after being elected that we were we campaigned as new labor and we would govern with new labor so very much a focus on a break with the past now we we are all i would suppose quite familiar with um what this means in terms of policy and in terms of the government's actual performance and indeed it would probably be superfluous in a to, you know to an audience of this kind to sort of run through that but i think there are a couple of features which are important partly because we might understand how clear a break new labor was if new labor took uh, the pro-capitalist wing of the labor party's policies through to their lo logical conclusion had taken the labor rights policies through to their logical conclusion he wasn't alone in this and he reflected i think a trend in many social democratic parties throughout the world new labor looked in many ways to america it's you know fairly common for the labor right um, and to do that and in particular i think that the project that blair believed he could undertake was of a uh, 
a type of democratic party, but not just a democratic party, but a party like the American system, which had a series of leaders and then a very loose aggreg aggregation of followers. So our European idea of a party with members, which then gets people elected, in which the party and the membership are the beginnings, this was now being replaced by uh, a type of party of notables, a party of leaders who then um, uh, you know, rally their followers. In a way, it's like a throwback to the, the 19th century before modern parties are formed. And indeed, it reflects you know, a very different type of politics in the United States. So this was Blair's, I think, aim. And in many ways, he came very close to doing it. And his dominance in the party and the way that he structured this um, was really quite strong. Um, we, you know, we're aware of the foreign policy moves. We're aware of the opposition that the, that the war in Iraq and Afghanistan had. But in broader terms, he achieved much of his, uh, of his, um, uh, of his uh, policies, his internal policies. And also he re you know, retained control over the Labour Party. Um, you know, even as, even as late as 2010, uh, he in 2015, you could really argue that the Blairites and variants of Blairites were still effectively in control. Now, the, the, the politics, um, I think we would all be quite familiar with, but I think there are a number of uh, features there. Obviously, the abandonment of Clause 4, Part 4, that was a symbolic um, issue for, for, for Blair. Um, it had, I think, very little practical value by that point. Uh, no Labour government had seriously contemplated public ownership on any scale, or at least had even put it in its programme since the 1970s. But again, it fits in with this idea of, you know, turning your back on the past, this, this, re, this rebuilding of the Labour Party. But I think the, the ultimate uh, element in, in Blair's politics was an acceptance, essentially, of the status quo. And above all, not even, I think, a commitment to a sort of type of moderate reformism that would have been very familiar in the, 19, um, in the 1960s. So that uh, rather than directly intervening in the economy and in large parts of society, there was an attempt, I think, to uh, recognize um, that globalization, that capitalism could not really be controlled. Um, and in particular, this idea of realism, um, again, in the manifesto of 97, said, we accept the global economy as a reality and we reject isolation. And by that idea of accepting the global economy was that the, the capitalist economy could not really be altered. Now, obviously socialism in one country against the international power of capitalism is an impossibility. But what, what Blair is essentially arguing is that the job of a social democratic government is in a sense to protect the population from the vicissitudes of, of capitalism but not to intervene decisively not to restructure it um, it is in a sense an acceptance of the of, of the thatcherite reality and in many ways it's a clear continuation of thatcherism in that way so this i think ideologically does mark quite a further step to the right um, it does take the Labour right position, I think, to, to its, its um, logical extension. But even many of the older members of the Labour right who were still around were, uh, were, very, uh, were very hostile to this element of Blairism and indeed made criticisms of it, the essential acceptance of the nature of contemporary capitalism. The other, um, the other, uh, the other aspects I think that are, are, are worth um, are worth noting are the um, the uh, acceptance of uh, large parts of the Thatcherite settlement in general. Margaret Thatcher famously said that her greatest achievement was New Labour, and in a sense, what New Labour was intended to become was uh, another form of um, essentially conservative and pro-capitalist party along the line of the American Democrats and one which in a sense had, had, had virtually cut its moorings adrift from its uh, traditions, 
and from, from elements of its left. So the, the Blair project, I think, was, was quite clear in that. I think it proceeded often quite gradually, but it was, it was carried out quite ruthlessly. And indeed, uh, the, the purging of the left, the, the ending of, 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 of really any sort of left wing or democratic element was really quite, uh, was really quite apparent. Now, in describing this, uh, much of the academic literature, some, sometimes useful to look at it, describes New Labour as very much a coup d'etat, and it emphasises that Blair, uh, with the aid of uh, a small coterie of uh, followers, with some uh, right-wing trade union leaders and some elements in the PLP, had, in a sense, grabbed hold of the party. Now that's very true, and I think it is. I think it is important to sort of note that that Blairism was in many ways never really a mass force. Um, Labour's electoral performances after 1997 uh, started to decline, and indeed um, it, some of the biggest losses of uh, of Labour votes occur in the 2000s. So that indeed Labour loses between um, uh, 2015 and I think 1997 loses somewhere in the region between three to four million votes. So Blairism is uh, is electorally successful, but it's not. It doesn't, I think, infuse many people. And indeed, the um, you know the electoral failures of that period, uh, particularly in comparison, um, or the you know with what Jeremy Corbyn and some of the left are able to achieve in 2017. You know, I, I think is is quite an important, uh, you know, an important thing to be considered. But I think that we we have to move away just from the idea of Blair as an individual, or uh, in terms of uh, of, a, of a of a clique in that way, as useful as that is. Um, I've tried to emphasise that we could see the origins of aspects of New Labour in, for example, um, the the politics of previous Labour leaders. Indeed, we might argue that, in a sense, um, the New Labour's origins go all the way back to the origins of the party itself. Blair, um, in one of his few historical moments, commented that the creation of the Labour Party and its separation from the Liberals was one of the was probably the biggest mistake in British politics, and. Um, he uh, often argued that his form of pragmatic, uh, I, I wouldn't even go so far as to say management of capitalism, but acceptance of capitalism uh, was really an integral part of the labor tradition. And I think he's right that in terms of the way that the, the, the pro-capitalist leadership of, of labor operated, I think you know, he's accurate in that regard. But in policy terms and in management terms, he does have, some antecedents uh, closer than than 1900 and I've, I've referred already to some in the 50s onwards but i think the other uh, i think the other elements that we've got to look at is the uh, is the decline of the left and in particular i think um some of the the impacts of thatcherism and what will increasingly be seen as or is referred to in trade union circles as the new realism, an acceptance of the status quo, an acceptance that any sort of project of even moderate reform is unlikely to be electorally successful. And so I think um, you know, periods of really quite deep disillusion um, start, to, um, you know, start to sink into the left. I think this is also accelerated and is accelerated in a, in a rather strange way, but in a way which I still think um, needs to be discussed much more widely, the fall of the Soviet Union, and indeed uh, a whole series of developments internationally uh, amongst radical nationalist movements, uh, accommodations between those movements and imperialism, all I think seem to give a sense in, in that period of uh, that the that any left wing or radical politics were no longer on the agenda. Um, why I say that this I think seems to have a strange impact is of course that few people by this stage on the far left anyway 
had 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 any real illusions in the Soviet Union. So it wasn't as if, for example, uh, these the, these currents on the left were people who, um, you know, had a belief that the Soviet Union represented some sort of model for the future. But I think it's very clear that the the change in geopolitics after eighty nine the end of the Cold War, and indeed a whole number of patterns do seem to accelerate this, this period of uh, disillusion and disintegration. Labour Party membership falls, I think, quite severely. And indeed, in, all, in the organised left, numbers of people just simply uh, fade, fade away. So the rise of Blairism, I think, represents that, that, that disillusion. There's also, I think, um, the workings through of some aspects of the political and the, the economic and the social changes of the 1980s. And um, in the fashionable sociological language of the time, this is often defined as the working through of a post Fordist economy. Now, uh, I wouldn't entirely go along with those arguments, but what I would argue is that certainly the decline of many parts of manufacturing industry the growth of new forms of, um, of employment, uh, particularly in white collar and financial services. All of these things did lead, I think, many people to argue that the traditional politics of class and the traditional politics of the left um, had really run their course. Remember that this is the era of the end of history, Fukuyama's argument that bourgeois capitalism, liberal democracy, was now in the ascendant, you know, that this was, in a sense, the end of, of history, that we'd, we'd reached a, a period of Alfhaven, we'd sort of reached the, the era in which contradictions are resolved, and that, in a way, all the great questions had, had been put to bed. So, in, in that sense, uh, Blairism, I think, comes out of that defeat of the left in the Labour Party and in the wider Labour movement. Um, so it's a, it is very much the product of disillusion um, in that way. So how did the Labour left respond? How did the left in general respond? And I'm, in a sense, going to draw together in my last uh, three or four minutes um, some of the um, themes which had, had sort of arisen in some of the previous talks. Um, I think at the time, Blairism was was not much understood, and it, it was only with its unfolding that any sort of analysis emerged. Um, I think in particular, uh, for many people, um, uh, for many on both on the Labour left, but perhaps more widely, um, the idea of Labour as any sort of site of struggle uh, and and a belief that it could it it could be an area in which people could perhaps move through again uh, was ruled out. Indeed, the the the, the Corbyn surge that's going to come, um, you know, some twenty years later, you know, twenty fifteen onwards, was um, was was completely I think unexpected at the time, but would have been ruled out by most uh, people on the left, many of whom believe that Labour was now just becoming a, a British version of the American Democrats. I mean, some groups had been long had been long term members of the Labour Party, completely gave up on it, uh, and others um, argued that uh, you know new forms of politics, different forms of politics, might emerge, but not through the Labour Party. But I suppose uh, what Blairism throws up for us, as, as much for those of us on the left as on, on the Labour right, is about the nature of Labour as a party and as, a, as, a, as a, a site of struggle for us. I use the phrase that it was a bourgeois workers' party, and Tony Blair certainly illustrated that. He was you know, quite openly pro-capitalist, much more openly and overtly pro-capitalist than probably any other Labour leader in history. But you know, they all were, in, you know, to, to, to that extent. Um, but it's, I suppose, the, what, the, what the debates that have emerged since then, both on Blair and indeed on, on the future of the Labour Party, is really what its place is 
in terms of any struggle for socialism and perhaps more importantly what we define by socialism not just whether there is a parliamentary road to socialism or whether um, socialism is about certain levels of taxation or degrees of nationalization of industry but indeed what we understand by it and above all about the the agency for carrying that out and the place of the Labour Party within that. I think that's particularly important for those who claim to be Marxists to try and define what they mean by socialism and indeed to, to understand the agencies that are going to, or the agents that are going to carry that out. Blair rested his appeal on the belief that, um, that history had ended, that, that capitalism um, was, was still an important dynamic force. We, I think, on the left are uh, in an era in which that confidence in the future of capitalism, not that we ever be shared in that, but that confidence in the future of capitalism and that sense that capitalism has, you know, an underlying stability, I think has true, well and truly been swept away, both by the financial crash 2007 and 2008, but also by the instabilities of, of various wars, imperialist wars, and indeed the emerging conflict between uh, China and the United States, between Europe and Russia and so on. In other words, that the, the type of confident world that Blair um, proposed in the 1990s, the, the, the world of the end of history, was, you know, I think has well and truly been swept away so our politics now, as we are trying to pick the pieces up after the failure of the Corbyn project, and when we, we analyze the nature of that, we can look and see um, from this earlier period, and indeed from this earlier history, how people on the left have, have, have attempted to analyze that. But perhaps more importantly, look at some of the underlying assumptions, both about the, the role of labor in that socialist transformation but the nature of our program and also i think about the nature of our ultimate uh, aims so i will leave it there and hope that this will throw up um, you know some further questions and discussion thanks thank you very much kevin um that is really it was really interesting i think it opens up all sorts of um questions because we got we do get a lot of um comments now that you know with Starmer's election he's he's another player right you know that's not that's going to all repeat itself what happened under Blair and I think you make some really good points why that might not simply happen uh, for a number of reasons um, for example yeah, there the the mass the massive economic crisis that's about to hit Britain as soon as all these um, subsidies will will stop and that will happen pretty pretty soon there's definitely not a end of history atmosphere a, a around there's certainly um areas of of um, alternatives are becoming increasingly important not that the labor left or the left uh, as an as a as a force is particularly well organized at the moment it has to be said it doesn't have many of the answers uh, and I think that's um, hopefully where, where groups are helping, like the Labour Left Alliance with our educational seminars can can try to make a change. But what also struck me when you were talking is um, how Blair clearly had a vision compared to um, Jeremy Corbyn, who I don't, as you know, was quite accidental and didn't really know what he was doing. But Blair came in, boom, you know, Klaus for gone, conference gutted. Um, you had... Uh, uh, the, the National Policy Forum, which was sort of mm. sl slightly introduced under John Smith, but was really um, put into into work by by Tony Blair um, to outsource policy making. National Policy Forum is where political ideas go to die. It's you get nothing through at all. It is an absolute waste of time to even try and get any policy through, which just means you know a conference has become a total talking shop. It, always been a bit of a talking shop but at least you could try and get some policy through so it's a, a very interesting um discussion but yeah the the, the change um between blair coming to power and now corbyn uh, starmer coming to power is, is quite different and under you know the circumstances of an economic crisis all sorts of things can happen if we are ready to make them to happen as well that's that's the sort of problem i think we're facing now Sorry, I'm rambling a bit because there haven't been that many uh, people indicating that they want to contribute, but 
Peter Kennedy has, so I'm bringing him in now. Um, before you, you come in, uh, Tina, um, because of technical problems, I can't see, um, I can't see anybody. So at the moment, I, I've just got a blank screen that's flickering, so I can hear you. Okay. Um, but um, I won't be able to respond to any questions. And if I'm, uh, if I, 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 you perhaps can see me, but I can't see you. Okay. We can okay. see so you. Okay. My yeah. apologies. I, you know. You're flying blind. I got it. Uh, yeah, I, and I was for most of that talk as well. Okay, sorry to hear <laughs> that. Okay, I hope you're... But let me know if you can't hear anything, then we'll have yeah. to think yeah. about the ways to do it. Okay, yeah. um, I'm bringing in Peter now. Hi. Hi, uh, hi Tina. Hi, Kevin. Uh, thanks for your talk. I um, found it really interesting. Um, a lot of complex political issues raised by the... Um, coming to power of Blair within the Labour Party. Um, I think, it, you know, this idea of um, a consensus, um, you know, we, we touched on the, or you touched on the idea of um, the post-war consensus and that given way to um, Thatcher and then Blair. And um, I suppose one way to look at it would be that there was a struggle in the post-war era over the centre ground to capture that centre ground between the Tory party, you know, the two main parties, Tories and Labour. And, um, and that was within the social democratic era, um, which was, which you've spoken about in earlier lectures. And um, I suppose the way I see the, the, the Blairism, if you like, Blair, Blair's policies and his politics and his capture of the Labour Party, if you want to see it that way, I just see it as maybe the turn within Labour, which it was always capable of towards um, finance capital. But um, there was a new centre ground and um, Thatcherism represents that centre within the Tories, which shifted. And that was driven for me by the, the power of the working class in the uh, 60s and 70s, um, 60s wildcat strike series of them, 70s longer. Uh, you know, prolonged strikes and shutdowns and cooperative movements and, and so forth. And then um, the, you know, the class struggle at that, uh, at that time became both economic and political. And so I, I see that that particular time was, and the response to it politically um, was one of working class strength and um, which saw the back of social democracy and the rise of Thatcherism. And I think he, so she captured the centre ground in terms of a new politics around Westminster, around parliamentarianism, which is reflected by that um, power of the working class and really the, the need to put a stop to social democracy. Um, whereas Blairism represents Labour's turn to capture that um, new, new centre ground. And you know, both of them were trying to express neoliberalism and Labour was based, uh, Blairism, sorry, was based on the defeat of um, left-wing politics within the Labour Party. So where the statue was based on the, the, the movement away because of the strength of the working class itself, Labour's uh, inability, to, you know, the left of the Labour Party's inability to take that on and exploit it and move with it, but allow, um, its failures to do that allowed a gap, a vacuum within which um, Kinnock and then you know, the soft left you talk about hardened up in terms of Blairism. And what, the way I see Blairism is that the Labour Party struggling to win that centre ground from Thatcherism and um, advance it in, in ways that Thatcher and the um, politics and the, the people around her and the class that she represents would endorse but also ways that she wouldn't endorse so much. And so I see this as um, tied into um, Blairism, if you like, trying to um, develop policies which further suited finance capital, which had uh, thrived on the, on the, on the Thatcher, you know, through privatisation, deregulation, tax on trade unions, deindustrialization. And take that on board, and take that to new, slightly new dimensions, while at the same time using the benefits of allowing 
free freer reign of finance capital to um, you know to pay for um, and expand uh, public sector services. So I see the unison, uh, the you know the new centre ground that Blair Blair took has been um, one that's in favour of finance capital, but using some of the money that was derived from the City of London and the, and the free and offer of finance capital to pump more money into the public sector. So, uh, but it was how the public sector money was then used, which benefits finance capital. So that's the funny thing as well. So that if you look at, um, I just got a few figures here, and um, between 1997 and 2007, welfare went up from 64 billion to 82 billion, uh, mm -hmm. spending on the NHS from 60 billion to 140 billion, spending on education from 37 billion to 73 billion. So we see that, you know, there's a real commitment by the Labour Party and Blairism to pump money into the, uh, into the public sector. But at the same time, that money was used to channel back to, to finance capital as a, as a kind of, um, you know, what um, Harvey sometimes uh, was called one time as the polit politics or the political economy of uh, uh, dispossession, if you want, where the state's been um carved out in terms of capital so it was used in terms of private finance initiatives so a lot of the the money that was challenged into uh, channeled into the nhs and the education was used for private uh, consortium benefits as well so while it raised and um, produced new infrastructure for public services it done so in ways whereby uh, big consortium consortiums won the bid and those consortiums were a mixture of industry and finance, i.e. finance capital. And they were able to then um, you know, put in these over, overvalued contracts and um, mortgage the public sector services and long mortgages, which, the, um, which they have to pay back. And, um, and those assets have, have, have been moved off, off, um, off the accounts of those original mm -hmm. consortiums because of the floating now around the, the financial markets of the world where people use them as interest bearing assets. And the asset is um, the NHS, you have to pay back that, the education system have to pay back those interest rates. And that's the same with, um, if you look at spending, we said there's a welfare spending increases now, but that was used to bring in things like the New Deal welfare to work, mm -hmm. uh, a switch from um, unemployment and dole seekers to job seekers. You know, this new category that you have to be finding employment to get to be paid for your welfare and the stringent attacks upon um, those claimants too you know they didn't show up at the job center all these were like continuations and advances and amplifications of, of earlier work by Thatcher so it's that um, that that for me is the you know is the um, the kind of contradiction which blurism represents that you know, um, the taxation which which was used from finance was used to kind of pump in public sector, which some people, which a lot of people benefit from. You know, new hospitals, new uh, being able to take on more employment in the public sector to a certain degree, even though there was an int intensification of the labour the labour force there. You know, we should also note in this time the rise of HRM functions within big organisations. The shift away from a personnel function, which was a social democratic enterprise, mm. towards human resource management, which was about bringing in private sector practices in the public health service, mm. so the new public management. And um, and if you look at you know just one more point, the first thing, what what was the first thing um, Blair Blair done Blair and Brown done you know because we've got to remember that Brown was here mm. as well, and um, they give the Bank of England free reign. Mm. one of the three axes of finance capital in the UK, free reign to determine um, interest rates and uh, mm. monetary policy. And they, they presented um, that nexus of the treasury and the bank and banking industry and with a, a new authority, which was light on regulation, which is the financial services authority. Mm. And that allowed the, um, the continuation of this deregulation of finance. So the so right from day one, 1996 in in, in May was it? Yeah, when they got in the, mm. the first week, Monday back, first week on the job, first day on the job. They, they, that's what they 
first task was. And then from there, the splurge in public services, once they went through a bit of a freeze to, um, to balance the budgets for a year after Thatcher, after beating Major, um, the, the Tory party. So um, for me, it's a fact, it's the Labour Party showing its colours, it's a bourgeois party, and it represents the new centre ground. That's all it is, a new centre ground. Out goes social democracy, incomes finance capital, and Labour tries to square the circle with its roots in, in the you know, public ownership, in public sector provision, but on the back of like free enough finance capital. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm just going to read out a quick question from Nicholas Jones before I bring in Matthew Jones. Um, he's asking, I would be interested to hear speaker's view on why Corbynism as a project failed ha. Mm. and the comparative views of Corbynism, Blairism in terms of the ultimate project of the Labour Party and their respective limitations. I was thinking actually during your opening, if the time is already ripe for a, a session on Corbynism. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Okay, Matthew. Yeah, no, I think a session on Corbynism would be really interesting, I think, and I think you'd probably get some some really interesting contributions um you know um i think that i mean this is a really interesting this is a really key period this i think in terms of the the whole change of the world um i mean you, you know if you look at the whole the arc of the labor party um the one thing that is there up until 92 is is the soviet union I mean, you know, from the point essentially when the Labour Party is effectively formed as a as a membership and an organisation as a, and begins to challenge for government in nineteen, you know, the early, after the First World War, right up to ninety two, that that is there. The, the working, I mean, you know, however however um, perverted or whatever else, and however bad Stalinism is, which obviously, you know, some of us would would, would argue was was pretty awful. Um, the you know the fact is that, that it does constrain capitalism i mean capitalism doesn't function uh, as a world system it's constrained uh, and it and it's dis it's dissolution the fact that the, 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 the bureaucracy then converts itself into the ol oligarchy and, and, and etc uh, and, and and takes the capitalist shilling then really allows capitalism in a sense to to, to reformat it reform itself as a world system which then obviously changes the the, the, the ground for, for for the rest of the rest of the, uh, the class relations and politics generally. I mean, you know, um, and this has taken a, a while to work work its way through. I think it's still working its way through. The fact that 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 that, 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 that event has happened. Um, I think that the other thing, of course, is the relationship between between New Labour and finance capital, which is extremely close. Um, I mean, far closer than, than 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 anything else that you've seen in terms of any other uh, form of the Labour Party in in, in or out of government. You know, uh, that, that, that Blair relies on on Lord Cashpoint. Um, that, <laughs> that there is this very very close relationship between Brown and his mate Ronnie Cohen, who's a private equity man. You know, uh, the whole thing is integrated into the into finance capital, which you can see with with Starmer as well. I mean, if you look at Starmer's Starmer's famous uh, list of sponsors, and some of the same organisations crop up, you know, as, as actually we're sponsoring and, and supporting Blair. It's, it's effectively the same, the same thing, um, you know. So, but then, obviously, then you see, you know, the uh, again finance capital itself uh, bringing being brought in, you know, over that that period, and then of course, in, in the, the the key the implosion of finance capital in in oh seven oh eight. Uh, which I mean hasn't hasn't been solved, and, and actually in 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 many ways actually leads to, you know, austerity and Corbyn. You know, the, Corbyn is a product of that uh, of that event, and that's again that's still working itself through. I think that the other thing you're seeing, of course, is the is the decline of the U.S. at the same time, and that you know immediately after, uh, you know, within, within, within a couple of years of Blair getting in, uh, you have the the election of 2000. Um, and the event, the, the rise of the neocons in the U.S. and, and the fact that this mm. is based on the fact that the U.S. itself, the U.S.'s own power uh, over the world economy has got to the, you know, is got to get to the point where it starts to, to 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 get crazy and starts to say, well, okay, I mean, why? I mean, what on earth? And any logical person would say invade Iraq. 
I mean, it's mad. They controlled Iraq. I mean, it was always said that the Saddam Hussein never did anything without consulting Washington first. He didn't. You know, it was just, it's a sort of, you know, it's a, as, as the thing declines, it then attempts to, 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 to grab hold a bit more and more bits of the world by military force, which of course is, is itself just accelerates the process. And you can see that going, going through at the moment. And I think the, the other thing, of course, is the, is the issue of the organization of the working class. I mean, for us in turn, you know, if we look at it, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what's happening in this country, in this country, in terms of, you know, deindustrialization and the, the, the methods of the capitalists in terms of in trying to make sure that they can uh, fragment the working class down to, to, to as small units as possible and, and preferably actually reduce them to atomization and, and precarious forms of working which start to, to come through in, term, in, in, in this period in, in larger and larger um, numbers. I mean, if you look at, say, where I work, I mean, uh, you know, in a major, major co co company, I mean, in, in, I, I think that there are probably uh, contracted 20 different companies that employ people in the building when, when I'm in the building uh, uh, that, 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 that have, have people in there that are directly contracted to, to my employer. Um, and it's that sort of method of, of chopping up the working class and trying to prevent the organization of the working class. And then, of course, re ultimately, as I say, reducing, the, re reducing it to precariousness. And the, 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 the inability politically uh, of the left um, to deal with that. And then, of course, obviously, the unions. I mean, the, the problem is, of course, the political, the political um, basis of the trade unions, of course, is pretty, pretty minimal, unfortunately. <laughs> You know, there's not been an application of, sorry? Right. Yeah, I think the, the, the problem is, of course, that the, 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 the generally, I mean, if you look at the unions, I mean, the, the, the problem is that the, the, the political basis of the union is not particularly profound. And of course, essentially, they, could, they only see themselves as, as in terms of, uh, of having a deal with, uh, with an employer, as opposed to, you know, actually, you know, having a notion that, that you're fighting class war, um, you know, uh, and, and therefore, it, they become increasingly um, sidelined and, 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 uh, and actually unpopular among, among large sections of the working class itself because of their inability to actually deliver. Um, so then, then this whole problem of, the, of how does the working class itself organise and on, what, on the basis of what politics? So all of this stuff is, is opened up. And, you know, really, I mean, you know, Blair is, is, a, is a sort of facet of that. Um, but there's a lot of other things going on at the same time. Uh, and I think that, I mean, equally well, Corbyn's another facet of that, but, but in no, neither of those actually resolve um, the issue, they, you, know, they, uh, you know, either for the left or, or for the capitalists. So, you know, we remain, you know, in a position in which the system is in greater and greater crisis, unresolved crisis, and in which, and in which unfortunately, the, the, the left and the working class has not actually presented anything coherent. Uh, as an alternative. Thank you, Matthew. Sorry, I interrupted you there. Um, no, no problem. Um, Kevin, do you want to have a couple more or do you want to reply to a few things? I'll, I'll just reply to a few things, okay. Tina, but I won't, I won't go on too long, I hope. <laughs> um, some quite good points there and my, uh, my apologies for not really raising them. Um, I did I did, Peter, uh, hint at your, um, your, your point about the importance of finance and finance capital. And I think in particular, the, um, you know, the, 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 the relationship of new labor to that. One thing that struck me though about aspects of their economic policy was uh, that in many ways it was smoke and mirrors. And it's, um, it's almost the ideal form of political economy for uh, contemporary finance capitalism, so that it, it rests upon derivatives, it rests upon uh, fictitious items that are cut and sliced, and you know, it is very much uh, smoke and mirrors. And I think the, the focus on finance capital, particularly under Brown as Chancellor, the uh, independence of the Bank of England, so-called, and um, the, um, the arguments that Labour, New Labour was intensely relaxed about people making money um you, you know is uh, is very important um in that sense uh new labor is is 
really is a, a, a capitalist project. And um, you can see there that the that, that player represents those attempts um, by the capitalist class to um, um, rejig their project, to reframe it, to indeed to, to make it popular, to give a, a raison d'etre for it. Um, I was particularly struck, um, something which I, it was in my original notes, but I didn't include it in my, uh, in them, but you raise it, Peter, and that's um, the acceptance, I suppose, of the basic laws of capitalism, and therefore the role of the state is, is to turn essentially the workforce, that's us, and to make us more resilient and more capable of, of serving capitalism, you know, the, so that um, man is made for capitalism, not capitalism made for man. And so a lot of the, um, a lot of the social programs and the New Deal and, and, and so on are all designed to turn us in, you know, to, to encourage us to work. And indeed with other aspects of the, the sort of communitarian, uh, quite socially conservative policies of New Labour, we are to be um, trained we are to be prepared to be a resilient workforce for the new globalized economy. And I suppose it, it, it sort of rather struck me that, um, that even social democrats in the past would have attempted to deflect those rampant forces of capitalism, you know, ra rather like um, a human being would build shelter against the rain. But what New Labour did was it didn't build a house to keep the rain out. It gave us an umbrella and sent us back out into the storm. And so it's that idea that um, we have to, in a sense, accept the nature of this new capitalism, because all of the the types of economic measures that Peter outlines were, you know, were clearly geared in this way. I think I think Peter's point on the state is also important because state expenditure was a very important prop for finance capitalism, uh, both under Blair and under Thatcher as well. Things like the PFI and um, the, the role of, of marketization and above all the marketization of the National Health Service all begin a pace under Blair. So I think uh, I think you know some quite important some quite important points there uh, in that way. Um, uh, Nicholas, um, you've asked uh, <laughs> you have asked a question which should really be dealt with in another session, uh, and I hope that uh, Tina will facilitate that. Um, I'm not volunteering, but it, it does need to be discussed. I think um, I think there are a number of comparisons, and one of the one of the points I tried to make about Blair as a, 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 a an individual and to look at his background and look at the times that he emerged in is that interestingly, both Corbyn and Blair uh, came in in as MPs in 1983, and indeed, um, although although Blair comes from a a slightly uh, higher professional group, um, you might see some sort of similarities initially. Um, but what I think is interesting about their periods is not just the nature of the economy, the nature of a whole range of objective factors, you know, which um, um, Matthew referred to really, the impact of the 2007-8 crash and so on. So all of these things, I think, do come to mind. But I think there's also a clear subjective factor. And, um, and this is that, uh, that Blair is fairly determined on what he's got to do. He has a, a lot of wind. Uh, he has a headwind behind him. He's got a lot of support. And that support comes from the media. It comes from a ruling class which accepts his bona fides. Now, he can then act with confidence. I think the, the the comparison with Corbyn with the Corbyn project just on this, you know, this sort of level, is I think that Cor the Corbyn project was was very unclear, even by the standards of the Labour left historically, it never had a very clear set of policies, and indeed I think, uh, whereas whereas Blair did not exhaust his political capital and he maintained his connections with the ruling class which kept him in power. For a long time. Corbyn, I think, uh, did not um, use his political capital and in, in particular the momentum uh, 
no pun intended, which had been built up inside Labour's ranks. And indeed, some of the momentum which had occurred as a result of the 2017 election. And I think that essentially what lurks behind that, this doesn't, this doesn't entirely explain the failure, but what lurks behind these two as, 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 as people, and therefore I think as representatives of different political traditions, is that, is that Blair has a very clear set of aims and follows them through. Corbyn not only doesn't, and again, you could possibly explain that by his, um, the surprise that, you know, he'd won, um, rather like Claudius in the Roman Empire being called out from behind the, um, you know, the, the curtain and being uh, put on the throne by the Praetorian Guard. So he's, he's the most surprised person in the room that he's become the emperor. But the point is that when, when Corbyn does achieve the leadership, I don't think he follows through either organisationally or ideologically. His programme, I, you know, we can discuss the, the programme for managing capitalism that is what, you know, the, for the Labour left often constitutes socialism. But I think more importantly, he does not carry out the counter-attack against uh, his opponents in the PLP. He does not mobilise his followers. He does not, for example, allow um, uh, mandatory reselection. In other words, there's a series of compromises. And what ultimately happens is that his enemies remain in charge. So I think, you know, it's a much more complex process than that. And I think it reflects, you know, certain aspects of Labour left policies about the nature of socialism, about the, the you know, the subjective agency of the Labour movement and of the working class. But I, I, I think the comparison between the two, and in many ways that does encapsulate much of the history of the Labour left, that it's, not only is it not being determined and militant in opposing the right, but indeed its tendencies towards compromise and conciliation, uh, particularly in trying to make concessions to the centre, which is in effect to the right, is quite a key element. And I think Corbyn, you know, Corbyn does reflect that. So on that sort of personal level, um, you know, it, there is a fashion in, in, um, in some historical biographies to often do a, um, you know, a great lives where you compare two disparate characters and look at the similarities and differences. And I think there is a, there's probably an interesting comparison between those two, but it's, it's, it's got, it's obviously much wider, uh, you know, factors than that. The, um, I, I just sort of briefly on Matthew's points, I think the, I think the ending of the USSR, uh, particularly as a restraint on capitalism, and I, I, I suppose as well, uh, it represents in however distorted a form, an alternative to capitalism. And I think this is particularly true in many developing economies and societies. But it does mean, for example, that when it comes to geopolitics, that uh, imperialism often gets a free hand, um, that it's able to um, carry out wars and, and carry out its policies without any sort of restraint. And um, so there is, in fact, a destabilization in that way. But I think, um, I, I think some of the other factors that you allude to, but it, and I think this is again important, is the, the issue of class consciousness and the impact of deindustrialization and the growth of new forms of, of, of work, uh, you know, the precarious nature of work and so on. Now, that I don't think is any reason to be. Um, you know, ultimately pessimistic. Um, after all, you know, capitalism has gone through many forms before, and these types of capitalism are, would be quite familiar to people at the end of the 19th century. But it does mean that um, the movement, uh, you know, ha is undergoing change. And I suppose we have to recognize that there have been really very great setbacks. And I think, particularly in terms of, of um, you know, the political understanding in the labor movement. And I suppose that when we see the emergence of new left wing formations that grew uh, after 2010, after 2015, we can certainly see the limitations of them both ideologically and organizationally. So I think um, we're certainly in for quite a, a period of struggle, both within the labor party, but also within the wider movement. 
and above all to try to reclaim the idea uh, of uh, socialist consciousness and indeed of uh, of the the need as as martin sorry as matthew says that in this uh, nature of in this period of crisis that you know both the ruling class and the working class you know facing this crisis and it's the working class that must um take power and, you know ultimately that's the only solution but we we have yet to build any type of movement that's anywhere near approaching that and that's that i think is our task and okay. quite right thanks you kevin um and next speaker is ken there you go Hello, uh, thank you again for a most interesting talk, Kevin. I wondered how far the unions actually wanted Tony Blair as leader or how far he simply made use of them. And did the unions know what they were getting? <laughs> That's my question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Liv is next. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I, um, I wanted to um, just focus for a minute on what um, Kevin was actually just talking about, the working class and uh, their lived experience during this period. Um, because I think that is a real determinant of um, <clears throat> where people stand politically when you look at what their economic situation is. And when you look through the 80s and uh, 90s, and really all the way up into the financial um, crisis of 2008, then uh, you're looking at a period or a standard of living um, are continuing to rise. The people in work, people who actually had a job, I mean, they were still doing all right during this period. And I see that, um, uh, largely as a consequence of, um, well, two factors really. When you look at globalization, I mean, the impact of globalization for ordinary people is that, you know, was actually, is actually cheap goods in the shop. I mean, when you look uh, at that period, particularly when we come into the 90s, so that's when you really see China exporting everything mm -hmm. from children's toys to um, new um, equipment for the kitchen. So, you're, you know, there is a, a you know, a, you know, a massive change in in um, the cost of you know of a number of basic um, or not so basic, you know, uh, what you might even consider luxury items. And when you consider uh, that, in addition to that, and all the stuff that we were collecting during that time. You've also at the same time, of course, through uh, financialization, as people have you know, said already, the growth in uh, the use of credit cards. Mm. And so at this same time, you've also got a massive explosion in private debt. And that also still continues you know, to, the, you know, to the present day. You've got um, continuing growth in home ownership during this period. So a growth in uh, mortgage debt. Um, but also credit card debt, credit card debt for whether it's going to be for those um, cheap goods for your kitchen or for your holiday um, abroad. There is a, you know, there is a huge, huge explosion in private debt, uh, which is um, funding this standard of living increase during this time, because it's not off the back of um, any improvement in productivity or, mm. or the or, or what our economy is ac is actually doing mm. when we uh, so then uh, we get to the point of 2008 and the financial crisis and it's really at this point well later to be honest it's really not until you get to, i would say until you get to 2010 because it's at that point that's when we actually start to see austerity coming in and re uh, and really mm. beginning to bite and that really, I think, is the wake up call for a lot of people that actually, yeah, maybe there is this thing about, you know, um, class conflict and maybe there are, you know, something that is a working class. Maybe we're not all bourgeois. And that, um, 
wake up call and I think what's happened since you know 2010 has also had you know uh, differences across the country but also generational differences when you look at how young people are affected I think they're in many ways more affected or they are um, they've taken a lot of the brunt of what's happened through uh, through the privatization years um, which has effectively priced them out of housing whether to buy housing or to rent housing and obviously it's had a massive impact on their employment as well what they're doing and the terms and conditions of their employment in terms of um, <clears throat> uh, zero hours contracts etc etc and I think the uh, um, part of that, that, those generational differences, I think goes a long way to explaining what happened with Corbynism. Because when you look at what happened when Corbyn uh, took the leadership of the Labour Party, one of the first things that happened was that massive explosion in the, in the membership. A large number of whom were young people. And these are the young people who are directly affected by what's happened in the past 20, 30, you know, 40 years now. Their lived experience is quite different to that of their parents or their grandparents, you know, for that matter. And so I think it, I think it is important, you know, to understand those changes within the working class if we want to address what we can do um, in the situation that we're now in. The only other thing uh, I wanted to say, I haven't fully uh, thought through this, it's something that has come up a lot in, uh, because of what happened uh, two weeks ago with the um, uh, murder um, of George Floyd in the United States. The whole militarization uh, of the police and the violence you know, um, of the police. And I think that has actually gone into people's consciousness and it's been there i think for a long time anyway because when you look at what happened with the demonstrators even in 68 um, uh, in the united states the anti-war protesters there are a number of you know white bourgeois students who were shot dead uh, by mm -hmm. um you know u.s forces and i think these things play heavily in people's minds if you decide to take up arms you know, against uh, your rulers, it has consequences. And I think uh, that we on the left, particularly the revolutionary left as well, we don't talk about this. But it's actually pretty fundamental if you are serious about revolution to think about it and talk about it. I read history at university in every revolution that I have read about and I can think of ended in a bloodbath. It's important for us to think about it and talk about it because it's important in order to get our strategies right about how we see the movement going because I do see a lot of conflict coming in the near future. Not only um, from what we're talking about here, the economic uh, issues, but also because of uh, climate change and the impact that's going to have on us as well. Mm. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Liz. Important points, yes. Um, Alan Donovan is the last speaker with a hand up from the floor, so if you want to speak in this discussion, please raise your hand, otherwise um, Kevin's going to sum up after Alan has spoken. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks, Tina. Uh, Kevin, again, very interesting. I think it's, it's a period that's much more recent, so it's something that um, everybody I would have thought has lived through and um, can appreciate the good points and the bad points. Um, I think, yeah, we were all possibly glad when Tony Blair got elected, um, taking the, the time that we've been without a Labour government for that time. I think that, as you said, there was the whole movement was changing and he changed the movement very drastically from getting rid of Clause 4 and the whole change of the situation. And I think one of the key points is what you mentioned earlier. When you get somebody like Thatcher um, complimenting him for carrying on her policies, 
And when he made it quite clear that he, one of the people he admired was Thatcher and he was going to carry on her policies, one of the points that I'd like to raise is, um, is there any point really in electing a Labour government that is carrying on Conservative policies? Firstly, um, I think that there's a lot of good things that, yes, he did as far as the minimum wage um, spending on the various um, health service, schools, etc. But I think on a lot of those things, um, as you said before, they were done in a capitalist way. So we've ended up paying for it years afterwards. Um, and it's meant that um, the benefits that we might have got then have ended up possibly leading to some of the austerity that was um, caused mm. and the problems we've had in the current years. Um, and I think that that hasn't helped. I think also he could have done a lot more with the majority that he had at the time. Um, he was possibly in a stronger position than possibly any Labour government has been since '45, certainly, to be able to be a lot more um, radical than he ended up being. Uh, and I think also we can't forget the effect of the foreign policy had towards the end, particularly the Iraq war and his foreign policy generally, and the fact that he ended up becoming, um, in some ways, a puppet of the USA, um, which didn't help. Um, I mean, I think when you look at the some of the foreign policy that we had under Cook and the more... Um, policy to look at the um, at society as much as anything else, improving society around the, the world, um, I think was the way to go. I think when people compare, and I think when Tina said about the strength of um, Blair compared to Corbyn, I accept that the difference was that Blair came in, he knew what he wanted, and he also knew a long time before he came in that he was going to be leader so he had much more time to plan for it and i think it's also a difference of in effect having somebody that's come in with a much more dictatorial um leading in other words not wanting um, conference to have any power at all and not really wanting not really having any interest in the members to someone that I think, although he wanted more power to the members and more power to conference, in the end, I do agree that Corbyn become too conciliatory. And again, should have been much stronger towards the end, uh, particularly on the back of the um, 2017 election, where after that he, he, had, he should have had more strength but I think um, towards the end uh, become weaker and wasn't in a, should have been stronger, particularly against the right MPs and the media. Um, finally, just to see how you feel the situation between Starmer and the current leadership is in comparison to the Blair situation, and also what chance is there of the left now in the... Labour Party generally. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> big questions. <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> okay. what do you think? Uh, th thanks very much, Alan. Um, lastly, um, you always come in near to the end and ask um, some very good questions and often I don't get a chance to answer them, but I'll try a little more this, this week. Um, I think that um, I think that the point that you made, uh, although you you know the question that you made about um, comparing Corbyn and Blair is is an interesting one because I've never really seen politics rather like a football match. You know, um, I don't know if you're a football fan or even if you're of that particular era. But, you know, the argument always used to be that when, um, you know, when Clough took over at um, Leeds, that the players wouldn't play for him. And it, it was always a case that the manager, you know, changed the nature of the team. In other words, that the focus on a leader and the focus on the nature of leadership, you know, only go so far. And I, you know, I did try to say about 
about Blair being a world historical figure, um, not, you know, not to inflate him or to inflate his own ego, but to try and make the point that he represented particular forces. And in a way that his type of politics responded not only to the needs of the ruling class, but also there were many sections of British society that, that could see that in the new capitalism that was apparently so stable, that his sort of policy would work. So for me, the question is not really, uh, is not solely about leadership. I think leadership is, is vital. And I think that leaders at all levels who are arguing and campaigning and trying to persuade people are absolutely essential. But I think it's also the, the role of that movement itself and the nature of that movement. So in comparing where we are now with where we were a few years ago, I think our task is in some ways quite similar. And that was that we neglected when we had that big membership, when lots of people were looking for answers, when lots of people thought that, that uh, the Corbyn project might provide solutions. What we as, uh, as members of the left, I think, failed to do as a, as, a, as a group was to really offer them any sort of program or even any real form of strategy for just simply democratizing the Labour Party. And I think that um, it's that. We're talking about rebuilding a movement. We're talking about turning um, our ideas into the ideas of you know, masses of people. And that's more than just winning a few votes in a meeting or even getting half decent MPs. That's really, uh, you know, a, a really quite a major, a major job in that way. Um, so I think that uh, we're, we're talking about building up, for example, the confidence of, uh, of the labor movement. We're talking about creating, you know, a program for, for real transformation. And, you know, the point that Alan makes right there as well, you know, is there any point in electing a Labour government that, that, that carries out conservative policies? Indeed, could a Labour government just elected even on the most radical pro programme if, um, if it wasn't prepared to challenge the real centres of power in the country, could it, could it go anywhere near doing any form of reforms, much less radical change? You know, the experience of uh, not just the revolutions that Liv referred to, but, but even of, of other movements in parliamentary democracies where um, the, the state and the capitalist class will attempt to sabotage them. So I think that we, we're, we're talking about rearming and rebuilding our movement. And in that sense, it is, um, it is a long job. And it's a job that, you know, I think is the same, whether it's Starmer or, or uh, or Corbyn. And I think our failure to do that, you know, is, part, is, is partly a product of leadership at the top, but it's also our own, uh, you know, inadequacies as, uh, as, as members of the wider movement. Um, on Ken's point about the unions, um, well, I, I think that the union leadership was fairly well aware of what, what Blair was doing. If you remember, he, um, he said that it, it was a case of uh, fairness, not favoritism. And um, in a series of meetings before coming into office, he made it plain that there would be no return to all those, those phrases he loved, like beer and sandwiches, and you know, there'd be no more cozy chats. And, and if you remember, he um, distanced himself considerably from the unions. Now, you know, individual union members Obviously, uh, union leaders didn't necessarily like that, but I think um, to a certain extent, they'd already accommodated that from the late 1980s. You might, uh, you might remember, Ken, um, there was a, a phrase which I think started to emo emerge around about 1988, referring to the new realism and union leaders began to accept that the, the anti-trade union laws and indeed the, the, uh, the nature of the economy would mean that they would now have in a sense to accept it. So there was a downplaying of, um, of indeed any form of industrial militancy. There was the growth of so-called service unionism. Um, 
and if you look at levels of strikes and the nature of those strikes, you'll see that um, I think that, you know, again, there were some sections who, you know, possibly in more powerful positions, but in general, levels of strikes fell. And, you know, my experience of, of working during that period was that um, there were, you know, a sort of sense of demoralization. Um, so I think that, that they were very well aware of what Blair was going to be like, and they accepted that. They accepted the limitations, and indeed, you know, like many people, they'd in a sense bought into this argument that there was no alternative. Um, I think Liv made some very interesting points, and one of the things that I perhaps should have made more of in my opening was on the nature of the economy and um, the apparent strength of the economy which in the 90s and the 2000s almost was another you've never had it so good era. Um, and I agree with her that for many people through, through credit, particularly through mortgages, um, that it was quite possible to, uh, you know, to enjoy a, you know, a, a certain living standard. But I think that also rested upon the growth of quite precarious work. And in particular, um, the, the replacement of quite secure, reasonably well-paid jobs, often with good, strong union protection and so on, with newer forms. I'm, I'm thinking something that I became aware of in the 1990s, the emergence of the call center, the emergence of a whole series of service jobs, which were um, you know, quite precarious. And above all, in which um, uh, if you didn't have access to regular, a regular income, uh, then your ability to, to buy a house and from that access more credit, which of course was the main function of housing, I think it was, a, it was part of that. And this was also, I think, something of a virtuous circle for capitalism, because of course it was the basis of um, finance capital. It, it then fed into um, the, uh, you know, the various uh, derivatives and, and so forth. And of course, this creates a very unstable form of capitalism, but it also gives something of the illusion of, of wealth and of growth. And um, you know, the point you make live about the continuing issues of debt, and indeed this will be a problem, I think, uh, for individuals and for companies uh, for um, you know, easily the next 10 or even you know, further years. Um, one thing though, and I would like to just sort of perhaps round up on this point, and it's actually, I suppose, about generational differences, and in particular, perhaps looking to the future, uh, particularly your, um, your question about, um, you know, a revolution, revolutionary strategy, and the experience of other revolutions. Well, I think that we have to learn from other revolutionary movements and there are a lot to learn from a lot of different uh, facets. And I think we also have to learn from the wider uh, history of our labor movement internationally. And it's very clear that we've been in periods like this before. It's also very clear that many of the things that I've been talking about, you know, from the whole of the 20th century, they do often seem to reoccur. Now, I'm not going to go for an ahistorical idea, almost of a, of, um, a sort of cycle, like an inter eternal battle between left and right that swings one way and then another. Um, but I think we can see similarities. But I think one thing that, that the 20th century has been, uh, has been uh, you know, a century both of tremendous opportunities for our movement but also tremendous defeats, not only for our movement, but for humanity as a whole. You know, the slaughter of the two world wars, the rise of fascism, Nazism, you know, the extermination of human beings uh, on racial grounds, um, you know, unemployment, social deprivation across the globe, imperialism, so on and so on. But what I think this, this resolves itself down to is something relatively um, relatively straightforward, which is that in those countries where there have been successful revolutions or where there have been successful revolutionary movements for any length of time, they have relied upon uh, groups and parties committed to the idea of revolution. And that's, that's clearly very important. But they're also uh, 
I think, rest upon uh, a conscious and uh, indeed a mobilized uh, working class itself. And I suppose the, the issue is that capitalism has been in, in forms of decline since the First World War. And so the opportunities for us and for our class internationally to, um, you know, to take power have, been, have occurred. We had a very good debate on the German Revolution, and that probably in some ways was one of the best opportunities and indeed is something of a turning point. So all of the symptoms that, that Liv and others have described about the nature of capitalism are not going to go away. Indeed, they will intensify, and the current crisis, I think, will see that intensification. So on one hand, we have these, these tremendous opportunities. We've got this, um, this you know, global crisis, and that throws up the, you know, the absolute crying need for, for socialism internationally. But what is lacking, I think, is, is leadership and very clearly a revolutionary program to achieve that. And what I hope um, that in any future meetings that we will look at that and look at our own failures and look at what needs to be done both here and internationally. So thanks. Thanks very much, Kevin.